Well, hi, Calvary Church Online. My name is Mark Riggins, and I'm the lead pastor. It's so great to connect today. And wow, congratulations, Nolan. By the way, if you've never been baptized, but you'd like more information, would you text the word baptism to the number on the screen? We'd love to get you more information. And the bottom line is we love celebrating baptisms here at Calvary. Hey, a quick update. Last weekend, our family ministries team hosted a COVID-friendly candy carnival. Check out some of these pictures. This is where kids played games from their cars and were given lots of candy. It was phenomenal. And Pastor Rob actually told me that between 350 and 400 cars drove through our campus as part of this event, and approximately 1,400 people visited our campus last Sunday. In fact, so many of you invited friends that approximately 70% of the people who came are not or were not Calvary attenders. We love that. And then this last Wednesday, our students had a blast kicking off the fall season with our pumpkin palooza. They had so much fun. I just want to say thank you. Thank you to all of you who volunteered to come serve and to share some joy with so many families during this unique season. So, in fact, if you're watching on your phone or on your laptop, would you do us a favor and just go in the comments right now and let our volunteers know how thankful you are for their investment in our children and in our students. They would love to hear from you. I think they would really appreciate it. So go and just give them a thank you today. Now, hey, if today's your very first time, if you're sitting at home and you're wondering, do I really want to watch church today or do I want to go and do something else? Of all the things you could do over the next half hour, let me tell you why I think you should continue watching. It's because today we're going to talk about a principle that is shaping your life more than any other principle. It's so powerful that if your future goes well, it will likely be because of this principle we're talking about today. And if things go worse in your future, it will likely be because of this principle we're going to talk about today. It's that big of a deal. So whether you're a Christian or not, you will benefit from the universal truth we're going to talk about or you will suffer because of this truth. The bottom line is, it is influencing everyone's life, whether they know it or not. So I hope you'll stick around, because we're going to talk about something that's incredibly significant and helpful, very practical today. So before we dive in, what we're going to do is we're going to sing one song together. Now, this is a great chance for you to pull out your phone and invite someone else to join you today. Maybe, maybe you would just recognize, hey, whether they're Christian or not, this is one of those messages that's just relevant for everybody. So go ahead and, and share this on Facebook or send the link to a friend and invite them to join us today. This is going to be one that's so applicable for us all. So we're going to sing one song and then we'll come back and we're going to talk about this life-changing principle together. But now let's sing. Earlier, Danny encouraged us just to pray over ourselves, to pray that God would give us hope in whatever we season we find ourselves in. And we can continue that right now as we worship him, as we praise his name, because we're going to sing this song called Great Things. And this song just celebrates God faithfulness throughout all seasons. And as we sing this song, I just encourage you, bring to mind times in the past that God has been faithful in the season that you have been, where God has shown hope into a situation that seemed hopeless, light into a situation that seems so dark. And as we sing these words, as we celebrate his faithfulness, just keep that in mind and let it just elate your heart and raise your praise up to him. So we're going to sing together. Come let us worship our King. Come let us worship our King. Come let us bow at His feet. He has some great things. See what a Savior He's done. See how His love overcomes. He has some great things. He has some great things. Oh, hero of heaven, you conquered the grave. You freed him, recapped him, and break every chain. Oh, God, you 
have done crazy things. We dance in your freedom, awake and alive. Oh Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted I, oh God. You have done crazy things. Sing, he's been faithful. And I know you will do it again For your promise is yes and amen You will do great things God, you do great things Oh, hero of heaven, you conquered the grave You freed it, we count it, and break every chain just praise you and thank you for your faithfulness. God, we thank you for you've been so, so good to us, Lord. And as we look towards the future, God, as we look into what is to come, God, we just declare that and we ask that you just show hope into our situations, God, that you give us a joy that overcomes all fear. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So my wife, Ginger, clipped these grapes from our little vineyard on our property today. Uh, we harvested these grapes today, but as you know, they didn't suddenly grow there today. And this is one of the truths we're learning in this season is that fruit doesn't grow in every season, but in every season is necessary in order for fruit to grow. It's one of the truths that we've been talking about in this series identify the season you're in. I'm so glad that you're here and you're part of this series with us today because one of the things we're going to talk about today is my favorite season of all, the season of fall. And so these grapes, though they showed up here at the church today, they've been growing there in our little vineyard for a really long time. They've actually been in development for months. But today, well, it was harvest time. And so we're actually going to talk about harvest time today. The Bible often refers to fall as harvest time. And so as we talk about fall today, it is my favorite season of all. And there's really two reasons why. Number one, being from Texas, the fall is the season that's furthest from the next hot summer. 
The other reason I love fall so much is it's when we get to see the harvest. It's sort of like nature's report card. It's where we see the results of how we've invested in previous seasons. It's finally revealed in fall. And that's why the Bible tells us that fall is a time of reckoning. In fact, I would say it this way. Fall reveals how I did in the previous seasons. Fall is when the fruit reveals how we have done. It reveals how effective or ineffective we've been. But there is one principle that actually determines your success or failure in the fall season. And it's this one principle. It likely explains what's going well in your life right now. And it likely explains what's not going well in your life right now. And here's the principle. Are you ready? I bet you are. It's simply this. You reap what you sow. Now, you might be tempted right now to roll your eyes and think, oh, I've heard that one before. I already knew that. But what we're going to talk about today are some things you may not have thought of as it relates to this important principle. But let me tell you what is absolutely true about this principle. You can ignore it, but you can't escape it. It's a principle that is as true as gravity. I can ignore gravity, but I can't escape it. You see, as I think of these grapes, as soon as I drop them, the principle of gravity kicks in and they fall. I can ignore that, but I can't escape it. In the same way, when it comes to sowing and reaping, the fall season It always reveals what we sowed in the previous seasons. I can ignore it, but I cannot escape it. And the current state of your relationships in your life is likely based on the way you've been sowing in previous weeks or months. The reality is your current financial situation is likely based on the way you've been sowing in previous weeks and months. The bottom line is this is an ancient principle that you can ignore, but you cannot escape. So what if we could leverage it for our good? You see, 2,000 years ago, there was a follower of Jesus named the Apostle Paul. He wrote a letter to some uh, new Christ followers who were living in the ancient city of Galatia, which is located in modern-day Turkey. And guess about the one thing he wanted to tell them. He wanted to tell them about this principle we're going to look at today. So if you've got your Bibles, let's look at it together. It's in the book of Galatians in the New Testament. We're going to look together in the sixth chapter. And if you're wondering why a part of your life is not the way you want it to be, Paul is going to say it's likely because of this principle. If you're wondering how your future could be better, Paul is going to say that you can have hope because of this principle. Let's look at it together. It's in Galatians chapter 6, and let's pick it up in verse 3. It says, If anyone thinks they are something when they are not, they deceive themselves. You think, well, how could they be deceiving themselves? What is it that they might be doing that would be deceptive? Or how would they be deceiving themselves? And we're going to see in the rest of the verses that Paul is actually saying that we deceive ourselves when we compare ourselves with other people. I don't know about you, but I am so tempted to compare myself to other people, to other husbands, to other dads, to other pastors, just to other men. And maybe you're that way too. We are so tempted to compare ourselves, and Paul is going to lay out why it is so deceptive. It turns out I can compare myself if I want to feel better about myself or if I want to feel worse about myself. It's sort of the pendulum. I can compare myself to Hitler and I can feel pretty good. But then I compare myself to Mother Teresa, I don't feel so good. And this is why Paul's saying comparing is so deceptive. Look what he says in verse 4. He says, each one should test their own actions. In other words, this isn't based on what somebody else is doing, but comparing your actions against yourself and not deceiving yourself by comparing yourself against someone else. It's like looking in a mirror instead of looking through a window to compare ourselves with someone else. But watch What Paul goes on to say, each one should test their own actions. And then he says, then they can take pride in themselves alone. Why? Without comparing themselves to someone else. 
I don't know about you, I think it's fascinating that 2,000 years ago, people there in Galatia in modern-day Turkey were struggling to compare themselves with other people. Isn't that fascinating? And here we are in the 21st century still struggling with the exact same thing that Paul is warning us against to compare ourselves with other people. Here we are with increased social media, increased awareness. It makes it even more tempting to compare myself with someone else's vacation, with someone else's you know, dinner plans, with someone else's perfect looking life or perfect looking day or great date with their spouse or their boyfriend or girlfriend. And I'm thinking, wow, I'm comparing their highlight reel with my mundane regular life. But when I compare, Paul says, I end up making excuses. But when I compare myself with me, I make progress. And watch what he's about to say. And this is the missing link for most of us. Look at verse five. Paul says, instead For each one should carry their own load. And this is the sense at which Paul is saying, you have to take responsibility for yourself, for myself. I have to be responsible for my family, for my finances, for my physical well-being, for the life that I have. I must carry my own load. Quit worrying about how others are doing. But instead, he says, what if you begin to say, I'm going to compare not how my marriage is to yours, but how my marriage is compared to how it was a year ago. I'm going to compare how my finances are now compared to where they were a year ago. I'm going to compare myself to me, and I'm going to carry my own load. I am responsible for who I am, and he's saying it's when you compare that you end up deceiving yourself, but instead carry your own load. Be responsible for yourself. And then he skipped down to verse 7. He says, and here's where we're going to get our principle. He says, but do not be deceived. You say, remember how are we deceived? He already said that through comparing. That's how we deceive ourselves. Hardest thing that we battle in this day, I believe. He goes on in this same verse to say, and here's the warning. He begins to kind of ratchet up. God cannot be mocked. This is a really big deal. He's saying God can't be outwitted. He can't be outsmarted. We can't figure out a loophole. God's gone before us. He already knows. You say, well, how is it that we would try to outsmart God? How would we try to mock God? Let me tell you one of the ways that we as Christians do this. And so if you aren't a Christian and you're kind of just checking out and watching today, you got to get a peek behind the curtain because here's one of the things that we do sometimes. We will think, well, because God will forgive me, I can sin and then ask for his forgiveness. Because if his grace is greater than my sin, then I can just depend on tomorrow's grace. But the truth is, forgiveness is not the removal of consequences. God will forgive because he's a great God and he promises to forgive. But it doesn't mean he's going to remove the consequences. I'll give you an example. Because God cannot be mocked. If I eat cheesecake every night for the next six months... And then I ask God to forgive me. You know what God will do? He'll forgive me. But the weight I gained over the six months and the gluttony that I've committed there, it isn't magically removed. My health isn't automatically uh, back to where it was. Because forgiveness doesn't remove the consequences. It absolutely still has what we sow is what we reap. We can't skip the fall season. Here's a principle that we get out of this verse. Tomorrow's forgiveness will not eliminate the consequences of today's sin. Or today's irresponsibility will have consequences regardless of tomorrow's forgiveness. Let me tell you how I see this as a pastor. As a pastor, I've known people who, they'll begin attending church. And along the way, they begin to change their habits in their life. And then I'll see something in them. And they'll, at some point, if they're really honest, they'll even complain and say, Mark, I'm doing my best but I still have so much brokenness in my life. And I always want to say, you are on the right track. I want to cheer you on. But remember, for the several years in advance, you didn't do your best. And now you're reaping what you sowed. Doing your best now doesn't erase all of yesterday's sowing. But here's the really good news. God loves you deeply. You know how I know God loves you deeply? Because he lets you know about this principle and how you can use it for your good. This is why Paul wants to let us know, do not be deceived, that God cannot be mocked. And then he gives us the principle, a man reaps what he sows. So here's the principle, you reap 
what you sow. It just is what it is. It's a truth. It isn't necessarily positive or negative. It just is a universal truth. Uh, pastor and author Timothy Keller, he goes so far as to call this the absolute principle in Scripture. He says it summarizes the entire book of Proverbs with this one principle, you reap what you sow. In fact, there are at least 66 places in Scripture where this principle is explicitly stated. It's a big deal, and it's impacting your life and mine. So where are you, and wherever you are today, is largely based on the decisions that you made in the past. And where you will be tomorrow is largely connected to what you do today plus what you've done in the past. And together, that will equal tomorrow. There's a direct connection between your current responsibility or irresponsibility and what you can expect tomorrow. Now, I'm guessing you've heard this principle before today, and none of this may be terribly new. However, now I want to share with you a couple of truths about this principle, this universal truth that you may have never considered, and I hope it'll be an encouragement for you going forward. Because you see, five years from now, the positive changes that are possible in your life are more than you can imagine. This is the principle God wants us to know. That you know how I know that these principles make a difference because of these next two truths. So I'd love to encourage you to maybe even write these down. You might want to plug these truths into your phone and just type them in there. These two principles make a big difference in really understanding you reap what you sow. Here are uh, the two principles. Let me start with the first one. The first one is simply later. The word later. It turns out the fall harvest will always come later than what you want. I know that's true of me, and I know it's true of you as well. Sadly, this truth is why we give up. It's why sometimes we read a book on marriage, we go to a marriage conference, but then our marriage doesn't get better immediately. Our, bar- our marriage doesn't even uh, become smoother. Instead, there might even be friction because we're identifying weaknesses, and we give up. Well, it turns out sowing and reaping is the principle, but it often comes later than we ever imagined or than, th- than we wanted. Same way with our finances. Like, you ever be in that place where you're thinking, man, I really want to improve our financial situation. So you start the budget, you download the software, you and your spouse begin to talk, and you make some hard calls, hard decisions, and a month or two go by. And instead of getting better, it actually feels worse. It's because it is uh, sowing and reaping, but it's always later. Harvest time is always later than we want. Same way with physical fitness. Like, I got to tell you, for me personally, I want to eat one salad one time and be able to look in the mirror and immediately see the difference. And that's the way I want the sowing and reaping to go. But it just doesn't go that way, does it? Our relationship with God. I begin to journal. I begin to spend time with God. I begin to pray. I have time in his word, but I'm not seeing an immediate impact. Well, the law of sowing and reaping always includes the word later. The hard reality of this principle is that it takes time to see your efforts pay off. That's why so many people give up and they just won't do it. And now we're in an instant gratification uh, society and, and we are an instant gratification generation. It takes time to reap the fall harvest. This is fascinating because all throughout scripture was an agrarian culture. It was even more true in how you would think about agriculture. You would sow in one season and then you wouldn't see the return till the next season or the season after that. Sometimes harvest could take weeks or months or even years, and maybe you're in that place of waiting. And if you are, here's a danger. Sometimes we will envy people who are doing wrong things because they seem to be getting away with it and enjoying so much success. And have you ever said anything like this? Well, is there any use to doing the right thing if they're enjoying success doing the wrong thing? We have to remember two things that Paul's already revealed. Number one, it's deceitful to compare. And number two, God is not mocked. And that the people who are sowing today will not produce a harvest until later in the future. And that's why Paul says, do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. The harvest comes later, which makes it easy for me to forget. It makes it easy for us to ignore, but God never forgets. The principle he reveals here is always true. Now, I mentioned there were two important truths to the sowing and reaping principle. The first is that it's later. The harvest always is later than we want it to be. But here's the second truth. It's also greater. 
It's later and it's greater. The fall harvest will be greater than we ever imagined. Now that's encouraging if it's positive. But the truth is, it's also true if it's negative. You see, this principle is not fair on the positive or negative side. Whatever you sow in the spirit, if you go on to verse 8, Galatians 6, 8, is going to be better than you ever imagined. But whatever you sow in the flesh is going to be worse than you ever imagined. You see, when we make a few bad decisions and life feels like it falls apart, it's tempting to think, I I don't know, I, I haven't always made the wisest decision, but I don't deserve all of this. But the law of the harvest, the law of sowing and reaping, it doesn't operate according to an exact proportion. And here's the bottom line. What we reap always comes back to us greater than what we sow. It's going to be later and it's going to be greater in a negative or positive way. Now you think about this. This is true with the habits that you sow into your life right now. It's also true in the thoughts that you fill your mind with positively or negatively. It's going to be later and greater the harvest that you'll have. It's true with how you raise your kids, how I raise my kids. In fact, one pastor once said, for every one lap a parent takes around the devil's track, your kids will take seven later and greater. So is there anything in your life, maybe it's dating, your marriage, parenting, your education, your finances, an area where it's just not the way you want it to be. Chances are you've likely sown your way there. Maybe there are some areas that are just really obvious, like your finances, and you can see uh, areas of your life that are also less obvious. Areas of your life that that maybe you're trying to figure out how you got there. Uh, Maybe it's an area of your life that you don't even like. And if you were to look at it right now, maybe it's an area, a relationship with one of your kids or or with your spouse. Maybe it's a relationship with your employer. Maybe it's a relationship um, with, with your own money. And you would ask yourself, how did I sow myself into this reaping? What did I do that might help explain how I got here? Now, let me be honest. It doesn't mean that you're completely responsible, but you probably have some responsibility. This is one of those areas in the the Christian world that always scares me when I hear other people who follow Jesus end up in this place. You see, yes, there are rare exceptions when someone is attacked in an unprovoked way where there's zero responsibility. There are rare exceptions where there's a tragedy that has nothing to do with us like a fire or a pandemic. But in most cases, you and I have some responsibility. It may be 5%, it may be 95%. And when it comes to the disappointments in life, this is where the rubber meets the road in our faith. So here's what I want to encourage you to consider. Is it possible that you look at your relationships and you say, yeah, my relationship with my kids or my relationship with my spouse, it isn't great. And yeah, there are other factors that you could blame. But could you also say that maybe you have checked out emotionally at times? Maybe you have been inconsistent. Maybe you have been impatient in those relationships. And there's something you can own. Or maybe you would say, look, we're over leveraged financially. But I did make some bad decisions. We did buy that house. We did make those purchases. We did misuse the credit card. And there's some things here that I can own. Or maybe you say, you know, my boyfriend or my girlfriend hurt me. And they are partly responsible for the pain that you feel. But maybe there's something for you to own where you could say, but I did go by all the red flags and there were people who warned me and I did keep calling him back. And there's something that you can own. You see, let me give you the biggest warning of the fall season when it comes to reaping and sowing. This, in fact, is what will cause you to be stuck. And if in life has disappointed you in some way right now, this warning is for you. Look at this warning. <clears throat> when things go wrong, you will be tempted in the fall season and harvest season to blame others 100% and claim 0% personal responsibility. This is what I believe causes so many of us to stay wounded and to not heal or to prevent our own personal growth. In fact, one of the hardest things that you will ever do is to quit blaming others and own the part you've sown, whether it's 1%, 51%, but to recognize there is part 
of your responsibility in this as well. Most people, and Christians are no exception, we will choose our reactionary response will be to blame others for 100% or to blame something or someone else for the circumstances that are difficult. And we will claim 0% responsibility. It happened in the Garden of Eden. It's been happening ever since. But that response, when we don't want any responsibility, when we keep pointing the finger, it keeps us stuck in our wounds. It keeps us stuck in disappointment. It causes bitterness to grow, and it stifles our growth and how God wants to shape us going forward. But here's the good news. You can leverage the sowing and reaping principle for a better future for you. I mean, think about it. It's not only later, but it's greater. When a couple decides to do financially what they should have been doing all along, their rewards are bigger than they deserve and bigger than they imagined. When a parent begins to pour into their kids like they should have been doing all along, their rewards are bigger than they ever deserve and bigger than they ever imagined because it's later and greater. By the way, those of you who are in high school or college, or maybe you're in your 20s, let me just say that those of us who are in our 40s and older, we heard about this principle when we were your age. And as a result, we established some habits at your age that we are now reaping at our age, good and not so good. And let me just tell you, you have a choice. You can learn from our mistakes and embrace this principle that Paul is talking about, or you can be a future illustration for the next generation. I hope you'll choose to embrace this principle. No matter where you are in life, though, here's what you must, must know. I hope you'll hear this today because this is true. God loves you, but he will not be mocked. This is a principle that explains much of our life today and will predict much of our future tomorrow. And if you're not ready for this principle, if you feel like, you know what, I don't know if I'm ready for the sowing and reaping principle yet, it'll be here when you're ready, when you're ready to acknowledge it. And in due time, this principle will reveal to you it's just always true. There's an old proverb that I think is pretty clever. It says, the best time to plant a tree is, well, 20 years ago. The second best time is today. Now, for some of us, it's time to start, start sowing seeds that are different so that we can have a harvest that's different. So how do you do that? How can you prepare for your fall, or harvest season. Maybe you're there today and you're looking at the fruit. It's not quite what you want it to be in your relationships, in your spiritual life, in your financial life. Ask yourself these questions. What's an area of your life that you don't like right now? And then ask yourself, what have I sown to help explain what I'm reaping today? That's an important question to wrestle with. Second set of questions. What's an area of your life that you do like right now? And then ask yourself, what have I sown in the past to help explain what I am reaping today? And just wrestle with that. Be thankful for it, but maybe this is something you want to make sure you continue to do. Well, as we wrap up our series on seasons, I hope you've been able to see which season you are in right now. Maybe you're in the loneliness of winter, as we looked at the first week. Maybe you're experiencing the hope of spring, as Steve led us through. Maybe you're basking in the satisfaction of summer, as Rob talked about last week. Or maybe you're right here. You're looking at the fruit. You're experiencing harvest season of fall. And you may or may not like what you see. But no matter what season you're in right now, I want us to end by giving you a chance to be thankful. Where Romans 1 says this is the premier value of the believer who's following Jesus is to be thankful. In fact, we're going to today call it radically thankful. Let me give you a couple of ways you can do that. First, would you spend time thanking God in your current season? Despite the bad, and, I, and it may very well be there in this season, would you begin by thanking him for all the good that you can still see. Here's, the, here's some good that you should be able to still see. God is still present. 
He still has purpose in this season. There's a lot of good happening in this season. There may be people walking through this season with you. You may have community in this season. You have a church that's praying for you in this season. Would you identify the good despite the bad and just spend time being thankful for those blessings? And then number two, and this will be, require faith. Would you spend time thanking God for your current season? And this may be difficult. In fact, this may require an act of faith on your part. The truth is, you may be going through grief, a loss, a trial, a difficult circumstances, an unmet expectation. That's going to be hard to pray and be thankful for your season. But here's what I want you to know. One day, you'll see that even the worst things in your life, God can produce good things. And there will be a day when you look back and you'll find it easier to thank Him then. What if you could begin, through faith, to thank Him now, even for this season? 